Storytelling is important to me because it's literally the oldest human thing. We've been talking to each other and telling us about our lives and about made up stuff forever and ever. It's the best way to communicate. Detroit, 1975. I was an anti-racist. It's five weeks after 9-11, and that means 15 days after the memorial service for my father, who was on the first plane. And her eyes start filling up with tears because I realize she's in shock because I'm passing as male and she has no idea. I really believe that you can't be enemies with someone if you actually sit down and hear them tell their story. I'm speaking to you in Spanish and you're speaking to me in English. Why? And she says, I thought you were one of them. It's Saturday morning and my sister and I put on our tackle football gear. Recently, I decided to go on the journey to go find my dad, a man that I hadn't seen in 30 years. The adrenaline is wearing off. I can feel a shooting pain in the side of my ribs. When I was seven years old, my dad was shot three times during an attempted kidnapping. We picked up everything, my family and I, and we immigrated to the US. We knew that it was better to be together than apart. When you're listening to another person's story, you kind of get wrapped into what they were feeling. And I, I really enjoy that. And there's not a lot of opportunities to do that with people that you don't know. Are you ready for some storytelling? Hello, and welcome to the Stories from the Stage Learning Series. I'm Liz Chang, General Manager of GVH and World Channel and a co-creator of Stories from the Stage. Well, you've told us that you love seeing ordinary people telling extraordinary real stories of love and loss, standing up for a cause, adventures in the everyday, and shocking revelations and even unexpected triumphs. You also love that our multicultural storytellers speak from the heart of their diverse communities and represent every kind of difference. Well, you can always check out worldchannel.org for the season schedule to watch stories based on a theme that's important to you, as well to subscribe to our newsletter and our compelling new Stories from the Stage podcast. That's right. You can listen while driving, shopping, and going to work. And now I'd like to introduce you to someone who has dedicated her career to transformative stories that can make a difference in our lives our longtime story coach and friend, the fabulous Cheryl Hamilton. Thanks, Liz, so much for having me. It is so great to be here. And I was just reflecting on how we're on the fifth anniversary, uh, fifth series of Stories from the Stage, um, which I hope if you have not watched, you get a chance to um, <laughs> today to, or this afternoon, seeing the stories. Um, and we're always looking for new tellers who wanna try the craft. And that's actually why we're here today specifically. Today's session is called Page to Stage. And during this session, we're going to be talking about people who started more as writers and then were brave and took themselves on stage for the first time, which our both guests today did. Um, Anna Hebra Flaster and Grace Talusin are both wonderful writers, wonderful storytellers, and I have the privilege of also being very wonderful friends. So I'm excited to introduce them to you this afternoon. We basically have two goals, hopefully to inspire you to do more storytelling and also to um, encourage people to sort of take away four lessons that the three of us have sort of drilled down and narrowed. And then we do invite you at the end of the session, we're gonna invite people to stick around if they'd like for 15 minutes to ask some questions but also you can put them in the Q&A throughout the session. I'll try to get to many as we can, but we are gonna dedicate some additional time for people. But without further ado, I'd love to just introduce you to our amazing guests. Um, first up is Anna Hebra Flaster from Lexington, Massachusetts. She um, fled Cuba at the, um, in 1967 at the age of five, and she is a writer and a storyteller, and she honors her immigrant history and the Cuban-American culture through her incredible writing, which you can find on the New York Times and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post um, and many other um, amazing uh, sites, uh, media. And also, we're so excited to, about her upcoming memoir called Radio Big Mouth <laughs> that is forthcoming and she could tell you more about that. Um, I'm also joined by Grace. Um, Grace is another accomplished writer. 
She's a Medford resident like myself and author of the incredible book, The Body Papers, um, which I encourage you to order today if you have not. Um, it has received much acclaim. It is. It was the winner of the 2020 Mass Book Awards in the category of nonfiction. It was also the Restless Book Prize winner for new immigrant writing. She's a Fannie Hurst writer in residence at Brandeis University. And very exciting, this month here in Boston, she was awarded one of the Brother Thomas Fellowships with the Boston Foundation. So I'm an incredible company and let's get straight to it. So Anna, can you tell us why you decided to be brave and tell a story on stage? Like what, what motivated you? Well, you sort of motivated me. Um, <laughs> me over the cliff there with um, believing that I could do it. Um, it was a really frightening thing, but what made me do it was um, the need to tell the Cuban American, the working class Cuban American story of immigration um, and, and telling it to as many people as I, I can. I feel like in a lot of ways I've inherited that story. I lived it. I want to honor uh, the uh, previous generations that have gone through that and, al and also to uh, awaken in people a warmth and an empathy for the refugee experience. Um, and so the more people I can reach with that story, the better. And I was willing to kind of live a nightmare <laughs> experience in a way of, of being in front of a live audience and, and, and sharing it that way because it could potentially reach more people. And we'll talk about that transition from nightmare to pride <laughs> as we go along. Um, but Grace, this is something else I know you share as someone who also came to this country as immigrant. Why did you wanna move from page to stage? Well, I, I mean, that was this time period right before I published my first book where I was trying to do things that scared me. I wanted to try to say yes to more and more things. I mean. And, and I saw, I mean, publishing my first book scared me, um, but I saw that I should try to do more things um, that was challenging for me and, and use it as practice. Like if I could practice doing a, a bunch of different things that were challenging, then I could prepare myself emotionally to publish my first book and to go around and do readings and events um, in support of that. So I really saw um, going from page to stage as this opportunity to work with folks like you, Cheryl, and, and other folks um, to practice. Um, and, and I knew that I would be a beginner you know, at, at the storytelling and I felt that that was okay. I got that message from you and other folks that it would be okay for me to be a beginner in this situation. So what was your, how was your craft a little bit different in the writing process for starting the first draft of your stories? What was the craft you guys approached you with? Grace, do you wanna kick us off? Sure. Yes. I mean, I had a meeting with you and we talked about different ideas and it was really invigorating and fun to, to have these basically like one line or title ideas for stories that I might tell about. And I took maybe five of those ideas and I started um, making some notes and making an outline for them. And then I started to practice and, and eventually one rose to the top of like, this is the one that feels like I could stand up and tell it. And it has the most life to it. I think that's an excellent point. It's funny when people approach me, particularly writers, they're like, okay, so I'll send you a draft. And I was like, have you said the words out loud to anybody, to yourself in your car even? Because there's a couple of reasons. One is some stories just don't sound as good spoken. I mean, there are sort of, they can be turned into spoken word, but I think they may or be better on the page, but also you have to know if you enjoy telling it. Like, was that a meaningful experience? And do I want to advance with this? Um, Anna, how about yourself? I think I know your answer, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that, the story that I told is pretty much a story I've been telling since I was six years old to all kinds of Americans who asked, oh, so your name sounds funny or, you know, um, you know, you're all speaking Spanish, where are you from? Um, it always came up. So I was very familiar with the, the theme and I, I know, I knew that Americans were, you know, very interested in it generally and that um, I could tell the story. What I didn't know was what I was going to emphasize 
um, and where it was going to end. I knew where it would begin, but I didn't know where it would end. Right. Um, so that's another point you bring up transitions. Um, well, Grace, you talked about transitions, right? Just trusting it, but also just trusting, like Anna, you said that you know this story. It's like some people, like even the day of filming will say to me, what if I get it wrong? I'm like, you can't, it's your life. It may not be exactly as you practiced or as you wrote, but it's okay. And we're gonna get into that more, but trusting that you lived your story and that the audience wants to hear it, right? <laughs> um, so let's talk about some of the lessons. You both shared like four really great lessons and it was wonderful to ask each of you because you both overlapped entirely in your four lessons. So let's turn to lesson number one. Number one is to be conversational. And it should seem like the most obvious lesson, but it can be sometimes the hardest to start with. So Anna, I know that being conversational was something that for you, the transition from being a writer to being on stage was a little bit anxiety inducing. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, I, um, I thought I knew what conversational meant because I started my writing career doing commentaries for NPR. And I knew what, I thought I knew what a conversational tone was, um, but I didn't, you know, I wrote what I, what I thought was a commentary, what would work as a, a storytelling piece. And do you remember when you came to, into my kitchen and you said, and I finished, um, you know, re, sort of reading it to you and you said, oh, you're a good writer, which meant this wasn't working. And what I realized was that, um, I was uh, reciting and trying to recite uh, because I was so scared of forgetting and forgetting what I wanted to say. And you kept telling me, it's okay, you're gonna make some mistakes, just go with it. Uh, but it was very hard as a writer where every sentence, every word is linked to the next word. Every sentence is linked to the next sentence. To think that I could omit a sentence and one, tell the thing I wanted to tell, and two, find my way back um, right. without notes. Because the thing was without notes, that was the scariest part of all. Uh, so I knew that I had to begin um, strong because if I began strong in front of the audience, I would um, you know, be in, in a good position, but I kept fumbling that beginning. In fact, even at the dress rehearsal, I fumbled the beginning. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll just recite it. And then when I recited it, it wasn't conversational, right? And it sounded. Yeah, that's actually a great transition. You keep talking about the beginning. Um, we're going to pull up a clip in a second of part of your performance on Stories from the Stage um, in the Helen High Water episode. But I will say that your, their, your idea about perfection and being conversational is so important. And one of the things I noticed, particularly like even in your first draft, is these elegant sentences that we just don't speak that way when we're sitting at a bar or a cafe with people, right? We don't say that my mother declared from the kitchen, like my mom yelled at me, right? It's just kind of moving towards that tone. But let's watch this. This is two minutes. I wish we could see the whole story, but we're gonna watch two minutes of your um, performance. So one night I'm at my Abuela Cuca's house who lives right down the street from us. And I'm playing, I'm chasing chickens. She had these skinny little hens that I love to chase around. And I hear a motorcycle coming into the neighborhood. So I want to figure this out. I, I take off down the street, round the corner, and in front of my house is a huge mob. And in, on the sidewalk is an enormous motorcycle. Inside, my father, is sitting at the kitchen table and he's answering questions that this government guard is asking him. Back here, my mother's running around packing a suitcase. And over here is my grandmother, Fina, Abuela Fina, who lives with us. That's my other grandmother. And she's holding my baby brother in a death grip, shaking and crying. I go over and I'm shaking and crying. And I'm asking questions, but kid, you know, nobody ever tells kids anything. But the guard notices me at that point. Niña, ven acá. Girl, come over here. Is it true that you want to leave your house and your friends and never come back? And my mother and my grandmother and my father answer for me, si, si, ella quiere, ella quiere. In no time, we're out on the street. And I, I look, and the guard is 
locking the front door and sealing it shut with a banner that years later I find out reads property of the revolution. He tells us to be at the airstrip tomorrow night at eight o'clock and the following morning we will fly up to the United States. So that night we spend at my uncle's apartment right above ours and people start to show up to say goodbye. My great grandfather, all kinds of relatives and then my first grade teacher. I love her but I don't know what to do with her in that setting and I, I don't want to look at her. My mother comes over and says, Anita, your teacher was very brave to come here tonight. Anna, you, nobody would know watching that, that you felt like that was the hardest part to be conversational and your most anxiety inducing part. What were you thinking? What was going on for you? I was, it's actually a, a moment at the beginning of that where I can see what I want the audience to see. Mm -hmm. And I stopped reciting what I had taught myself to recite in order to feel comfortable and get through those first sentences. And as soon as I began to see the images, and you can see that I'm going like this, and 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 because I'm seeing those things. And as I did that, I just felt that. The, the, the audience was almost behind me and I, and they could see it too. Um, and so I got in a way I kind of lost the audience and was just telling the story. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but it, 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 it was the moment, it was the moment where I stopped reciting and started seeing, and that unhooked me from, from the words that I had written that I, I felt I couldn't let go of. No, it's great. Some, some people that are new to storytelling, and that includes writers and non-writers, um, they will tell us about the story, but they don't tell us the story when we first start working with them. And once they get into the story themselves, then they discover, right, all these things, again, visuals and tastes and smells become very real, and then it's easier to craft the story. Um, Grace, um, did you find it hard to be conversational in your piece? Um, I, because I'm used to writing, writing down exactly what I want to say, um, I did at first. And so when I, when I made the switch to work from an outline, work from lines, like Anna, um, you had said the thing about having these lines or images that you want to, to move through, I found that really helpful. And I don't know if it was you, Cheryl, who told me this, but I thought of my story um, as crossing a river and each line or paragraph I had to, was a stone in that river. And um, so I needed to cross the river to like tell the story. And so I had these places I knew I wanted to go to and they were my, my stepping stones um, so that, that I wouldn't get lost in the story. I wish I could take credit for that, but I actually can't. <laughs> Okay, um, I've been giving well, credit. To you, I'm going to now steal it and use it with other people. <laughs> um, what's interesting is if someone wants to pitch the stories from the stage, and we welcome anybody, we have professional stories and new storytellers and writers and everybody in between. Um, we actually, the process is three steps. The first thing is you do write a short, by, a short 100 word description of what you think your story is going to be about. And if it intrigues us, then we're going to reach out to you. And the next step is actually a little scary for some people. We're going to ask you to send us an audio. We do not expect it to be polished. We expect it probably to change a lot by the time we get to filming it. But the reason we do that is we want you to try telling. Um, if you send me a script, it's going to be different. We don't write like we talk. And so people try that. And then they also discover, like, is this a story I even want to share? Um, but you both have talked a lot about this idea of perfection. So let's go to the second lesson that you shared. Um, I believe it was you, Grace, that was like, you have to let go of perfection. Um, tell me more about that. Sure. So when I write something, I can go over it many, many times, show other people, edit it. You know, there's this level of control I have over a piece of writing. Sometimes I've like uploaded or published something and then even went back and edited it, right? So that's a different kind of process. Um, performing, you know, live in front of folks with no notes, I had to let go of perfection. I couldn't, it was just going to be, I had my, my time that I was gonna go up on a particular night and I'm sure I could rehearse it multiple times and do everything I needed to prepare. But 
it was going to be what, what it was going to be. And I've had experiences of live performance as a musician. And so I understood that already that, you know, you can practice and practice and there's something that dynamic that can happen that night, um, you know, regardless of how much you practice. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Actually, it could be exciting and interesting to have that, that um, level of, of dynamicism in there. Grace, I just learned something new about you. You're a musician? I was, yeah, I played flute and piano all through the year. Anna, are you a musician too? I played flute a million years ago. <laughs> I love it. I, I did not play flute. I played piano too. I, I learned a little piano when my kids started taking piano, but you wouldn't right. want to listen to my piano. <laughs> Grace, I liked your um, your stones over the river. Um, yeah, the, 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 the goal is to know your transitions. Like, where are you opening? Where are you ending? And I will say that there can be perfect lines in the story. Um, in fact, I encourage people to have a few that they're excited and want to land on, particularly your opening line and your closing line. But again, you've lived your story. If you can get through those transitions, you can trust that the words will come out as they do. Um, Anna, what was your experience letting go of perfection? Uh, it's just so difficult. Um... I, I think Grace's uh, analogy, um, you know, to crossing the river, very, very, uh, you know, just stones and images. Getting to that image. To, I'm so sorry. Getting to that image. Um, uh, I, I began with a full draft and then went to a, an outline and then went to scenes and then ended up with four words and that's all I had in my head when I went and I knew that it was going to be very imperfect and I you know it's just it's frightening but um um I mean those four words and those four images got me through it and that's really it's all you need as you said those those key transitions yeah I, uh, I will say the phone call, we learned today that it's also Anna's birthday. So she's getting phone calls and texts and everyone just wants to send her love today. So I'm sorry, I thought I had shut everything off. No, no, it's it exciting to celebrate you. So <laughs> it's fine. Um, it's interesting in the studio when people come to tell and particularly right now when there's no audience, it's actually been harder for some people to tell their stories on stage because of COVID. We're keeping people at a distance it's quiet so they can hear every line almost too much so they can worry about it that when they try to say exactly the lines that they practiced if they stumble on one it can kind of derail the whole thing for them for some people like it like they have to like get back now we have some tricks in the studio which is you just go back to the beginning of that paragraph and keep yourself going and even in front of an audience you can do that i mean audiences are incredibly empathetic they're already impressed that you're up there at all <laughs> telling a story um and they just want to hear where you're going right was there anything else about preparing for just the presentation part that you had to do differently than perhaps giving a reading um when you go out and share your work yes i mean i um, would practice like a lot, <laughs> like I, when I was walking um, to work or if I was commuting in the car, sometimes I would listen, I would record myself and then listen to it. I, I mean, I wanted to know my story. You can't just, you know, go up and do it. I wanted, even though there's a lot of dynamic elements at the end, I knew that I'd be the most, I wanted to be the most prepared I could be so that I could actually enjoy when I was there. Because um, there's a lot of other things happening. So. Um, and it made, I mean, I'm, I grew up Catholic also, and I grew up um, with prayer. And there was a way that I was like using my story and going through my story in between things, um, the way I kind of was using prayer as a, as this like way to calm myself down or, you know, do something in between um, uh, classes or, or whatever it was that I was doing, washing dishes. I mean, it was something a religious ed education teacher had taught me actually was like to be constantly praying. And that's probably a whole other story, but. Um, I was gonna say, we're gonna have to get that back on the show. <laughs> um, Anna, how about you in terms of just the presentation of it? I don't know. I, I, uh, I'm just kind of reliving the nerves, just talking about it. Um, I know we're supposed to be um, acting as though, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's definitely achievable, but it is such a jump. It is such a jump for people who, you know, even as I said, you know, 
I, I've done readings. I've been on the radio. I, uh, but there are always notes and you just feel naked. You feel completely naked in front of all these people. And it, it is just, uh, and the closer the date came, the, the, the less predictable actually my rehearsing of the piece would get. And I'd be saying things I had never said before, which only threw me off more. Um, but, you know, that was the very first experience that I had. I have to say, and I would encourage every, every writer out there who's listening to this, that um, the, the first time is the scariest and it gets so much easier, like everything else in life. Um, and it is really rewarding. Uh, but I love, that, I love that for both of you is for national television. <laughs> Like you didn't start at like the local small reading. Um, it was great. And I think that motivates other people to trust that they also can do this. You're starting to bring up our third lesson, which um, Grace, uh, you just said, be prepared to feel. Um, absolutely. Um, that is a big part that I think is a little bit different than sometimes reading work or writing work. But Grace, why did you want to share this lesson? Well, this goes back to the difference between live performance and the very controlled environment of like being alone and writing. Um, but also it's the interesting and fun part of it um, too. And so, you know, yes, of course I felt the anxiety and nervousness um, of, of doing a live performance. But once that was out of the way and I was on stage, then I tried to pay attention to other feelings, which is like, oh, there's my father, there's my husband, there's them reacting to what I'm saying. And even though it's six to eight minutes and it's all going by fast, I also wanted to take the time to be in the moment and be really present um, and experience it. And, and, and because I did that, like that meant I was feeling things and, and um, feeling the audience's reaction as well. Um, so, you know, things can come up. I think sometimes we're afraid of feeling. I know that at times I'd be afraid that I'd cry um, and that I wouldn't be able to continue speaking. I mean, that actually was a big fear of mine with public speaking. Um, I'd lose control somehow. And, um, you know, I've, I've had the experience where I've been teaching and I've read something aloud that someone else wrote and I cried and, um, or had tears. And, and I just thought, oh, okay, there, I had tears, it, it's fine, <laughs> like I moved on. I, I didn't, you know, everything didn't totally derail in that moment, but the more, the harder I try to fight the feeling, it actually is more distracting and worse. So in those moments, I just thought like, let me just go on the ride and trust that um, if, I'm, if I'm really feeling it and, and in the moment and present that I'll be able to respond and continue. No, oh, it's a great point. We, um, one of my favorite stories on a st a Stories from the Stage is Shifra Burke's um, presentation in the same show you did on Suitcase Stories. Mm -hmm. And she's telling a story about her parents who survived the Holocaust and she gets a little teary, but how could you not? But also for me, it is the moment that I feel the most in the story itself, not even feel bad for her. I'm just moved by the story and that's important. I also think in terms of being prepared to feel, I mean, storytelling can become contagious and a lot of fun because there's not just the feeling of anxiety doing it. It's really the feelings of memory. It's the feelings of joy. It's the laughter that people share with you. So I wanna show that reaction from an audience by sharing one of Grace's clips from her story, which is on Suitcase Stories um, that she just referenced. So let's watch that now. But as happens sometimes, you go someplace and that place changes you. So my father started to dream and he started to wonder, what would it be like to stay here? What would our lives look like? What would the lives of his children be like? And so he took a risk and he took the exam for foreign medical graduates and he passed. And all of a sudden, this whole new world and future opened up for him and our family. He opened his own medical practice, hired a staff, um, bought a house in the suburbs, and bought his first new car, which was a Chevy Caprice Classic station wagon, turtle green, interior and exterior. Um, <laughs> And his idea is that cars are meant to be pragmatic. They should get you from A to B safely. 
And so one of the first things we did with that car is we drove to visit his brother and sister in Toronto. The family is really important in the Philippines and we didn't have family in Boston. So that was one of the first things we did. So we all piled into the station wagon. We drove to the Canadian border and the border patrol took one look at our um, station wagon, which was piled up with suitcases and our passports, which were just about to expire. And he sent us back. And he, um, I didn't know at that time, but soon after that, we, our status became, um, we became undocumented. Our status became, um, we had overstayed our visas. And my parents hired a lawyer to regulate our papers, but the lawyer didn't help and um, took their money, but it took maybe 15 more years until we were able to fix our status. But I didn't care. I didn't know any of this stuff. I was a kid. I was an American, as all my friends were. I rode in that station wagon to school, to my activities, to band practice, to soccer, and I had no clue that this was all going on. Oh, I really encourage people uh, to go and look up these stories. We are putting them in the chat and watch the full versions. Um, something that both of you do so beautifully and, I, and also in your writing that I've read is to mix humor and, um, and also joy and also sadness so that we're not only taking a roller coaster of action, but we're also having an emotional roller coaster. So I thank you for being brave and doing that with us. Um, Grace, how is it to watch it after so many years? It's been four years, I think, since we recorded your story. Yeah, I'm, I can watch it now. It's like, um, what is that aversion therapy or something where like you keep watching the thing? I mean, I've taught it before in, in my classics because I have, I was so inspired by this experience, Cheryl, that I have my students do it over a semester. And we start out in there and they are like, no way, I can't do it. And we work over a few months and like they're doing it. And so anyways, I use my story as an example, so I've seen it a few times, but I wanted to focus on this part because it's a part where you can see me stumbling over my words. And that's because I was never supposed to talk about this. I'm not supposed to ever talk about how we were undocumented, especially when we were undocumented, because it was dangerous. Like what if the wrong person heard? And what if they told the government? And so, you know, as much as I practiced, you know, there was this point where, where I'm realizing like, oh no, I'm saying this in front of an audience and I'm not supposed to ever tell that um, about my family, even though we were US citizens, we've been US citizens for a long time, those secrets that we're told to keep, um, you know, it's pretty strong that that part of me that wanted to, to still keep that secret. So, so that's the part that, um, that I was, uh, you know, wanting to focus on is I was still stumbling a little bit and making mistakes and, it's okay. It's part of the story experience and of what happened that night. Well, and also, I mean, to find out that your father was in the audience. I mean, we were all like, where is he? Right. We all just, you got, I feel like I was watching him watching you as much as I was watching you. And it was so beautiful. Um, Anna, you've joked about how, or been honest that the first half of your story, you were nervous and anxious and like trying to find your way. But then you said by the end, it was really transformative. Um, what happened for you at the end? What were you feeling at the end? Uh, the feeling, I, I remember just getting goosebumps at the end. And um, sometimes that, that happens when you're doing a reading and you're really into it and you lose yourself. Um, but the difference was that people were right there and um, I felt like we'd been on the same, uh, shared this, this, this journey together. I felt connected to them. And um, like I had accomplished this goal, uh, and and yeah, I would. I, it was a. It was kind of a, a jolt of emotion. I really liked what what um, Grace had to. You know that that point that she raised about being prepared to feel because what you feel is different than what you feel when you're doing a reading. It is a, a, a much more. Uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. Um, intense, probably. Um, uh, uh, well, we're going to get to the last thing about audience engagement for a second. Um, but Anna, I think I remember you saying that there's like three days in your life you'll never forget your marriage, your birth of your children and telling a story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that surviving that day. Uh, and then, and I was so, my, my kids and my husband were so proud of me. They knew how hard I had worked to get comfortable with it. And 
um, it, it, I was euphoric, frankly. I, I one because it was over, <laughs> and and two because I had shared it with with a, a, a lot of people in a live setting in an intimate way. It felt real. It felt I, I had I had a I had accomplished a mission, and and it was extremely rewarding. We know your next fourth most memorable day will be when your book is published and we can't oh, wait. That would be great. That would be perfect. <laughs> so let's go on to our last lesson and then we'll open up to questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We're excited to talk whether about storytelling or their writing or their lives as immigrants and the work that they do in the community, please share them. But the last thing speaks to something you've all highlighted. Um, but Anna, Anna, you said it, I think the most beautiful way I've ever heard. You just said you need to love your audience. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I think uh, I didn't know that until I was doing, I was telling the story the very first time. And there is a point in there where it was surprising to me as I was telling this live, cameras, all of that, that I started to really love these people. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I said or what, what point that was, but I felt like they were with me we were walking together. We were sort of like what you had described at the very beginning. You're at a bar, you're at a cafe, you, you're, you're with your friends. And there was a moment, and maybe Grace experienced this too, uh, where you're just one organism. And, and I thought later on that, sorry, I thought later on about how I wasn't really telling the story, I was hugging the story. I was bringing the story in to human beings and we were hugging together around the story. Um, so maybe I'm remembering that when, I, when I've done subsequent storytelling events because I, I have never, I have not come close to experiencing the kind of discomfort and anxiety that I did at the beginning. I, I believe that 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 hug is going to be there once I get going. It might be scary at the very beginning, but that hug is coming and I know it's going to be good. This is a preview of what wonderful writers you both are with the hug and the love. Um, but Grace, um, what was your lessons about engaging the audience that were different? So I grew up with this idea that, um, you know, public speaking is this really scary thing. It's like second only to death in terms of what human beings fear, which is you know, terrifying. And so um, that's kind of like my orientation towards it. I, I was uh, thought to be really scared. And then people had these this words of advice, like, oh, imagine people, the audience in their underwear, which also to me seems scary. And so, um, I put it, which I didn't want to do. And so I, um, but, but I love what you said, Anna, about this hug from the audience. And, you know, I, I think it's maybe it's the people who are attracted to come to the live audience of stories from the stage, but I really did feel like they were all my supporters. I don't know who they are except for a couple folks there, but whatever they were beaming towards me as a speaker, like I really did feel it. Like they were, they wanted to support me. They wanted me to do a great job. Um, they wanted to listen. They weren't going to interrupt me or distract me. I mean, I know you, I mean, I've been in the audience. It's not like you give us instructions or anything. And yet um, I, I felt that and it made a difference. And it is this difference between writing by myself and the beauty of telling a story live in front of people. And there have been times when I've written by myself and I've like conjured that audience up again in my mind. I can just actually like play the tape and like and see the audience um, again on video, right? Because that that is the audience I wanna think of when I'm writing by myself and it's hard because it's a group of people who want to hear your story, who are cheering you on. Um, the best kind of audience that you could have. Um, and so going back a little bit to my, the last question, like I didn't realize I would have fun um, and so much fun doing it. Um, and, you know, like Anna has the line about love your audience and, um, you know, it's like, well, I also felt that love too, like this, this like, you know, back and forth kind of experience um, of they are loving me and, and so forth. But. Yeah, I am. Um, there's a, I deliberately, before people go on stage, the last thing I say to them is two words, have fun. 
This is not a football match. No one's going to win or lose. No one's rooting against you. In fact, they're all rooting for you. They came to hear a good story. They came because they're excited for you. And so I agree. I think that's storytelling for me is the fastest way to connect with our neighbors. Um, and we just, we, all those onion layers, like they're eliminated. We just get to the heart of what connects us as humans. So um, that's also why I love keeping producing these with the team at World Channel and GBH. Uh, I'm loving that we're starting to have questions in the chat too. I'm going to start with uh, one question and then I want to share one more thing and then we'll open up for the rest of the questions. So let's start from the top. Um, can you please share how you began to know that you wanted to even be a writer? Grace, you're not Let's go with you. I know. Um, so um, when I was writing my memoir, I was looking at old photos and slides and I actually came across one of me with a piece of paper at two years old, um, like on a desk, standing and, and writing. And I couldn't, I mean, I was, I don't know what I was doing. Of course, I didn't know letters or an, anything like that. But it's something that I've been doing for a long time. It, you don't have to do it since you were two years old. But I've always been attracted to words. And I also, as I said earlier, grew up Catholic, like I, every week, I mean, I, I went to church and the word was what we listened to. And, and we were listening to stories every week. So and then I just loved, I went to the library and I loved reading and I, I wanted to do the same thing. It, it occurred to me at some point, I mean, I was writing anyways, but at some point it occurred to me that I could do it even more um, and, and get my work out and maybe even have my own book on a bookshelf in the library. Anna? Um, a lot of the same stuff. I remember Grace, like you, I think I was a little older, maybe five or six and um, hearing I always asked my parents about this story. It's sort of like an origin story, but I remember um, being at the kitchen table and, and having paper around and sort of doodling uh, as they talked. And um, I remember at one point, uh, one of the viejos, the old folks in the family, because we grew up in a multi-generational house. So there were a lot of different uh, age groups, but. Uh, them saying to me, you should write about this. I mean, I was little, you should write about this. Maybe that's why I remember, you know, scribbling as they talked. But my family was a family of storytellers. Cubans in general are a very verbal group of people. Um, that has to go somewhere, you know, at some point, you, you know, you've got to put it down. Uh, and then um, I remember early, I think I, I was in fourth grade was the, when someone first, when a teacher first said to me, you, you know, you know, you're good at that. And then of course, all you need is one person to say that to you, one teacher, respected teacher. I always loved my teachers. Um, and then that got me going. And then I realized I tried not to be a writer. Writing is hard. It's scary. And Grace said something earlier about how she conjures up her audience that from that night because it was so supportive. As a writer, uh, maybe Grace has, has this experience too. You've got that little voice in your head saying, that's not where that comma goes. That's not, that's not a good adjective. You know, what is that preposition doing there? What, why are you even talking about this? And so by, so my point is that it's hard. It's a hard and it's a negative and critical thing. And I think that all of that works to, producing good writing because you re you need to be critical. So your reader is gonna get something that's easy to read, delicious and, and enjoyable, um, but you're gonna suffer. So I tried not to write for a while. And I think that when you're a writer, you cannot write, you cannot not write. Um, that's wonderful. Um, it reminds me, I don't think either of you know this, but I went to the, I went to a school that I really admire. It's called the Salt Institute for Documentary Writing in Maine. Um, and I went there because I was terrified of writing. My application said, I can't write, help me. <laughs> um, but I've never become someone that's really can't not not write, but I can definitely not not storytell. Um, so it's, it, for me, it's great. Um, before we get to the rest of the questions, I want to bring up um, and acknowledge that every story though that we hear is going to have some fabulous lines that stay with them. And we keep using the word love. And I wanna share the love, the line that the producers and I discussed is the ones we love from your stories that we'll never forget. Oh. Um, so can we pull up the first card? Um, and Anna, in yours, it's the end. Someone, you have to watch the story to see this part of the story. It wasn't in the clip, but you say, 
The one thing that does make me does make everyone happy in the house is when we get a letter from Havana from the old women who never forgot us. And I have those letters now. They've been folded and unfolded so many times that they're like Kleenexes. I just, I will never forget seeing that and imagining it was a beautiful line. And Grace, um, yours, people also have to watch the story because it is the last line. Sorry to give it away, Grace. Um, but you say the green station wagon did more than just bring us all over the United States and bring us to school and work. It was the place where we became American. We learned what it was to become American. And we became that in that car. It brought us from safely from new immigrant to citizen, from alien to belonging, from A to B. I mean, just amazing, both of you. I probably should have had you read your own quote. <laughs> um, but again, everyone go watch them um, if you get a chance. Uh, now, we, this was scheduled till 12, 1245. If you need to uh, log off, we understand, but we do wanna give 15 minutes people who wanna stay. But before we do that, I do wanna answer some questions that particularly relate to how do you get on stories from the stage. So you can go to the link that's in the chat or go to World Channel Stories from the Stage and you'll see a line that says pitch. If you go to that link, you'll see the upcoming themes that we're searching for stories from. Again, you don't need any experience. Um, and you send in your story idea. Um, myself or another one of our coaches will reach out to you and explore the story. We're gonna ask for that audio. The stories are six to seven minutes. Um, and then from there, if you're selected, um, you'll get a coach who will support you through the entire thing. They'll deal with everything from the nerves to the words, to the logistics, to my favorite question, which is always about what do I wear? Um, but it's, it's a wonderful experience. And I know that Grace and Anna um, have reinforced, I hope that today, but thank you for watching if you need to log off. But if you don't, let's get to some of the other amazing questions in the chat. So Linda wants, oh, I just answered this one. Um, we do coaching. Um, it's usually about six weeks out, a month to six weeks out if you're getting a coach and you're preparing. Um, partly because I find if you give people a lot more time, it gives them too much time to overthink. But Kurt said, have you ever tried to get other writers to tell stories? And if so, what was that like for you? I mean, Either yeah, of you? All the time. I mean, I try to, um, I was trying to get folks to come to this who I've, who I've pitched before to tell them to try to do it um, because I think it's really great to, to do it. And so, but it's by example, it's like, you know, here's my, I guess I send them a follow-up email. Like, here's my, my, my story. If you have any questions, let me know. But I, if I see that anybody has any interest, I tell them to like check you out and, and to try it because it, it's a hard experience um, for some harder than others, but I think it's worth it. And, and it's only six to seven minutes and you can get through that. And you do feel like you've accomplished something, especially if it's something that you've always wanted to do or thought you couldn't do. Um, you know, that's, there's a lot of reward, I, I feel, in doing it. Anna, how about yourself? I've tried with my writers group mostly a few times, um, but what I, you can just see in, in the expression of people's faces is like, oh, I would not go there. I, you know, there, that it's, it is a, a leap. Um, you know, a couple I think have maybe tried, I, I don't know if, if they've gotten through or not, but. Um, I, I feel like we should put the whole collection of writers, page to stage writers, because there's, there's been, I don't know, 20 or 30 at least at this point. And I, I had to giggle at both of you that said, you know, I just, I, I, it was a bucket list. I, I taught a storytelling class, I guess, back when we were in person two years ago, and three women in the class had just turned 50 and told themselves it was now or never. <laughs> um, and two of them were featured on stories from the stage. The other person just didn't apply. <laughs> um, let's go to the next question is, oh, I love this. Um, how do you implement what you learned in storytelling now in your writing? So the other direction. Either of you? I've, I, I don't know, uh, Grace, when, when I'm writing, I'm hearing words. Um, and I think that that's gotten stronger for me since I've been doing live storytelling, you know, through suitcase stories um, and, and the stories for the stage. Um, so I think for me, it's just that I can hear better. Um, I can hear the words better. And I've always, when I read too, I don't know if, if you are uh, someone like, like me who, when I'm reading a, a novel, I'm hearing voices 
in the novel, you know, the different voices. And so uh, I think it's just a stronger, um, a stronger aspect of, of writing for me, that oral piece. Right, so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, what we can learn from oral storytelling is very applicable to, to writing and some of it might be in um, generating work and maybe we, you can, as an exercise, I've done this, like I start with, um, you know, telling the story, just telling it like if I'm taking a walk or in my recorder or something and then, um, and then writing it down. And that is what happened with this green station wagon piece is it existed um, you know, as this, this story and then I wrote a version of it um, for a chapter in my, in my memoir. So there's ways that you can go back and forth in between and, to, and in some novels and memoirs, voice is incredibly important. Like that is what's driving that piece. And so, um, and, and if that's the case for something you're writing, you can definitely leverage what you learn from oral storytelling with that. Okay. Um, I love this vulnerable and honest question. Robin says, what happens if you submit a story get accepted and then start to lose your nerve. <laughs> um, so I, I hope something that other tellers would share about Stories from the Stage is we're a really collaborative, super supportive team. Um, as I said at the top, we deliberately search out new voices. So we know people are coming in with the nerves and the um, worries about expectations. But one of the things that I think helps is that when you show up, there's seven other people more than half of whom have never done storytelling. So you become like a little like cheerleading team for each other and we're there for you as well. Our goal is to make you look great and for you to have a great experience. So know that we will be with you throughout, your coach will be there. Um, and I, I, I just, I encourage you to try it, just try it. <laughs> um, Bobby says, does every oral story need to end by telling how the teller was changed by what they have told? Ooh, I think this applies to writing or, yeah. or storytelling, but either of you want to tackle that? I think that that's the, the difference between a story and um, like scene setting or something. Like I do feel like there's needs to be some sort of shift. Um, the, the shift and, or change can be small. It can be mundane. It doesn't have to be life or death, but I, I do feel like I'm satisfied by a story when there's been some kind of shift or change. Anna, you're looking puzzled. <laughs> no, I agree. I just think that sometimes it is, it, it, I don't like the idea of spelling it out um, or saying it. I really believe, and I think that um, you feel it and you may even have a, I, I like it when I don't, when I have to really think about what that shift was. I know there was a shift in a story because I, I've been moved myself somehow, um, even, even intellectually moved. Um, I like to think back on it and I, I definitely don't like it when it's obvious or, or told to me. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about this in previous learning series and we talked about with all the, um, all of our participants. I mean, a story needs three key things. It needs, um, some sort of conflict that's going to keep us like what's going to happen. And that's, again, it doesn't have to be like a, being chased by a bear. It can be an internal conflict or a doubt or a bias or experience with somebody else. Um, it needs to have a compelling theme, something that all of us can relate to, right? And it needs interesting characters, which in storytelling is us or other people in our stories. So, um, so in that way, there is going to be a transformation, but it doesn't always have to be like my entire like life changed. It can be um, smaller and sometimes those are the most fun. Um, we often get people pitching for the story, for stories from the stage with their most epic story. But Grace, your story is epic and yet told through this really wonderful vehicle, literally a vehicle. And I think trying to break down your life into smaller chunks and find those unique stories that we can connect with is really critical. Um, let's get to the next story. Um, how do you decide who you're talking to in writing for people your age, for young kids, how much supportive detail? We could probably go a lot into this, but how did you decide who you were writing to? I mean, I think that you, knowing knowing who the audience was going to be and it, at that particular night, um, it's like people who decided to come to stories from the stage. And I think there was something about over 18. So I knew that we were going to be, you know, it was adults um, in terms of like, I didn't even think that, it, I didn't even go so far in my head to think about it was going to be a national, you know, um, show nationally. So I didn't really think that far ahead. I focused on this, the audience I was talking to in, in the room. Um, and 
be, like the beauty of, of story oral storytelling in this form is that it, we had a container of six to seven minutes. And so that meant that, that we had to cut, for me, I had to cut a lot out and I could only um, keep in what, what, I, what could that time period contain. Um, I always, I don't, I wouldn't say always, but in general, I picture my two friends, Wendy and Anne, who are avid readers. And we've been friends forever uh, since uh, middle school. Um, and I just picture telling them a story. Um, but having, having, you know, that imaginary audience that um, you know is, you know, knows you and you're intimate with definitely helps in shaping the tale. Anna, that's beautiful. I mean, I actually agree, Grace. To all, I mean, we, you do need to know your audience and what's the purpose of the event and who's hosting it because storytelling events are very different depending on who the production company is or whether it's a speech. But um, for me, Anna, I'm very similar to you. Um, I was recently thinking about how I got into storytelling and I thought it was like 20 years ago when I did this first on stage telling, but then I realized it wasn't, it really was high school. I was a bit of a geek and every Sunday night, my friends would come around and we put a bowl in the middle of the table and each person folded up a question, put it in the bowl and you had to each answer it, but it always was led to a story. And, I, and those are my friends 25 years later. And I think it's because we shared all of these stories with each other. Um, and it sort of sent us on this course together. And I love that it led to you two <laughs> being new friends of mine and um, participants in stories from the stage. I wish we could get through all the rest of the questions, but we are coming to the end of the hour. And I wanna share um, again, thank you both. Again, read um, Grace's memoir. The um, links are in the uh, chat. And Anna, we can't wait to hear yours. But in the meantime, she has wonderful essays you can find on all the big papers and online. So go hunt those out as well and make sure to watch their stories. Um, this is the second in a series of four um, for our learning series this, next, this year. In a couple of months, we'll be back with long story short. How do you take a memoir and bring it down to six minutes? What are the decisions? Um, what stories are you gonna keep? What do you let go of? I believe in writing, it's called letting go of your darlings. Um, didn't use that in storytelling, but I'm gonna steal it. So to wrap up, thank you, Anna, Grace, so much for being brave and to everybody else for tuning in. We're grateful for your time. Thank you. Have a great thank afternoon. You. you too.